right. All right. Am I on? There we go. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, bring it back together. Ooh, I really want all right, how's that a little better? Yeah. Let's go ahead and bring it back together. Uh, if you, do you still feel like I'm yelling at you from the back, or is this okay? I'm yelling a bit? Or can I do that? How about now? Is that better? Yeah? All right. Yeah, well, some of you might need yelling. That's possible. Sit back in the farthest from the classroom. Yeah, that could happen. Uh, so First Chronicles, where did we notice the law in First Chronicles? We didn't. We didn't notice the law in First Chronicles. Okay. There's not a lot of specific law as far as you should do this, not do that, but there's a lot of reference to laws. Where do we notice maybe some reference to people acting according to a law? Was that yeah. in the way that they were dividing families up? Okay, so the division of families actually is uh, part of the law. That's true, actually. Um, marriage is part of the law. Families come out of marriage, right? So there is there is some work of the, the law there, the creative work of the law. Laura, what were you going to say? They moved the Ark of the Covenant the wrong way. David's having a great time over there. I'm having a little hard time hearing Is that door open? All right, that's what's going on, yeah. Yeah, and David is, uh, yeah. 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 The guy Uzzah. Yeah. And the, the wrath of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah and he was struck dead. Yeah. And then, then uh, David's wrath is, is uh, kindled. It says David was angry because uh, the wrath of God uh, came out in this way. So uh, we see a work of the law there. It's being interpreted as a, a, a mishandling of the ark basically, is what's gone on there. There's a violation, even if it's accidental or incidental, that there's something important here. We've heard that story before in, uh, I think it would be Second Samuel uh, before when we've, we've heard this story, but it's here. Where else did we notice the law? There's a lot of things that are related to this, actually, in, in this section. What are most of the regulations that they're concerned with uh, throughout this book that we read? What's David interested in doing? Building the temple, right? There's a lot of emphasis in First Chronicles on the proper way to worship, the proper way to build the temple, tracking who are the Levites, because the Levites are the ones who specifically are charged with uh, the support of Aaron's descendants around the temple. Uh, so uh, there's the way the temple's built. Do you notice that part at the end uh, where, I mean, who builds the temple? So it, from what we've read before, First, Second Samuel, First, Second Kings, who's the one who builds the temple? Who's the king that builds the temple? Do we remember? Solomon, right? It's pretty much all put on Solomon. He makes a contract with Hiram of Tyre, this king of a foreign country who comes and contracts to build this and Solomon's palace. But what happens in Chronicles? Who builds the temple in Chronicles? It's still Solomon, but there's a lot of emphasis on David. David has the plans that he says he's received because God's hand is on him. Uh, David has prepared all the materials. He's told everybody, you know, Solomon's young and inexperienced. Help him out with these sorts of things. Uh, Chronicles goes way out of its way to give David as much credit as it possibly can for the building of the temple without actually saying that David built it. Because, of course, we know that David doesn't actually build it. So, but there's even in that, there's sort of this interest of like, David received this from God. This is God's instructions on how to build the temple. Now, isn't there a place there somewhere where it's told David not to build it? Exactly. Because he's a man of bloodshed, which is new too. I don't think we get that in First and Second uh, Samuel at all. I mean, we get David being a man of bloodshed, but that reason for him not building the temple is never given. That's a, that's a Chronicles. It's only reported here in Chronicles. Yeah. I think I see law where uh, they're told to wear linen mm -hmm. and the Levites carry uh, Yep. Uh, Good. So here's law around how they are to carry out their duties, uh, so around worship and the support of the worship um, uh, life of Israel, we could say. Mm -hmm. And they're burnt and fellowship offerings. Yes, uh, offering sacrifices according to the prescriptions of the law of Moses. Yep. How much law is it that uh, David 
passes down the kingship to his son. Oh, that is so. That is a matter of the law too. The the passing of power from one to another. I mean, the king is the brings that up. That's right. The king is the establisher of the law. Yeah, here it happens like three times almost, right? right. David's old. He makes Solomon king. Uh, they come and they declare themselves to Solomon. Later on, they do it again when they're gathering all the temple stuff. Uh, and then after David dies, Solomon was established as king. So there's at least three times where that's mentioned. Yeah. The promise on page 410. Oh, good. Yeah, he will not. Uh, well, say that again. He will not. The Lord God is with you. Yeah, Lord God is with you. This is page four ten. Yeah. yeah. So this is promise here. So yeah, this is a good transition into the gospel. Where do we notice the gospel in this text? Uh, I'd say maybe this is the key promise actually. But yeah, so uh, this promise that God will be with Solomon. Where else did we notice gospel? Um, uh, three ninety nine. Three ninety nine. Mm. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So uh, even though you are not the one to do this, you've shed blood and fought many wars. You will have a son who will be a man of peace and rest. I will show him peace uh, or show him, give him rest. Sorry, from all his enemies. His name will be Solomon. I will grant Solomon means peace, by the way. So Shalom is peace in Hebrew. So Shalomo is actually Solomon's name in Hebrew. Um, I will grant Israel peace and quiet during his reign. Yeah, there's a promise of something to come. Just a reminder that when Solomon was um, appointed to king three times, and one of those times we read earlier when they were trying to take away from somebody, I don't remember the name of the guy who was trying to take away from him. We, but, yeah, so we heard, uh, there's maybe a couple things you're referring to. Are you talking about right at the beginning of his reign, right, at, right when, when David's on his deathbed? When he's on his deathbed, doesn't somebody go in and talk to David and then say, hey, they're trying to appoint... So one of David's other sons claims the kingship for himself. I can't remember which one it is. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So, uh, yes. Well, let's let me, let's me come back to that here in a second because I want to I wanna go into surprises. And that's a surprise question, I think. At least it leads to surprises for me. Uh, any, other, any other noticings of gospel here? What about that great promise to David uh, that we heard before of uh, I will build you a house, right? Do you remember this? Uh, this is on, oh, I didn't write, I don't have my notes with the page numbers on it. Uh, oh, let's see if I can find it here. Here it is, uh, page 393. So this is almost word for word the same as 2 Samuel chapter 7, um, which I don't remember what page of that book that was on, but uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7 where David wants to build the temple the prophet Nathan says, yes, do whatever is in your heart to do. And then God sends Nathan back saying, uh, no, I've never, I've not asked for a temple. Uh, have I ever asked while I've been moving around in this tent and tabernacle? Uh, you know, why haven't you built me a house? No, instead, I will build you a house. It goes down. I will establish uh, your kingdom, your throne here forever. And this is the seed or one of the seeds, as we talked about, of this promise of Messiah, that this maybe becomes the key promise of Messiah going forward of David's throne hasn't lasted. How is God going to fulfill this promise to David? Um, so right at the end of that long paragraph on 393, or a few paragraphs, I guess, I will set him, that is your uh, descendant, I will set him over my house and my kingdom forever. His throne will be established forever. And I think we talked about this when we read it the first time in 2 Samuel. This sounds like Solomon, right? This sounds like it's pointing to Solomon and Solomon's descendants. And I think it is in the first hand doing that but when the kingdom fails, people say, okay, who is the descendant of David actually? And so eventually, this is where this calling Messiah the son of David, that's why people will, when they're thinking Jesus might be Messiah, they'll call him things like son of David. That's what they're referring to here. Maybe he's the descendant who will fulfill this promise, right? Uh, so that's maybe the key portion of gospel from a Christian perspective, especially, but even just from a the way that the promise lasts over the next few uh, centuries uh, up until the time of Jesus, too. All right. Yeah, did you have something? Uh, on 397. Uh, 397. Start, start from the uh, fourth of that space there at the top where Satan rose up against Israel. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Kind of puzzling, and then down at the yeah. bottom, 
it says that God relented, mm. having done yes. what he had done. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. So let, this is a good transition into surprises. So uh, what surprised us here? So a lot of what will, at least what surprises me in reading Chronicles is the way that Chronicles is telling the same story that we've read in a lot less detail, um, but noticing the differences that's, that Chronicles bring. So one of those differences we've already mentioned, David, I mean, Solomon is, is sort of the, the foreman of David's project of building the temple in the way Chronicles puts it almost, you know, like David dies and then Solomon does all the work, but David's got the plans. He's laid out all the material. You know, he's done absolutely everything. Um, and whereas uh, first, second Samuel or second Samuel, first Kings rather are much more, um, it's Solomon who does it with the help of this contracting. Here's another one. So Satan rose up against Israel. So we've heard this story before. Uh, this story is told in, it would be second Samuel somewhere. And, uh, uh, of, of David taking a census, and this is seen as evil in God's eyes, and David is given a choice of the punishment, right? And David, and we kind of talked about how David is, uh, he, he says, well, I, I could, and I don't remember what the three choices are. Oh, yeah, it's famine, famine, uh, three years of famine, three months of your enemies coming in, or uh, three days of plague. And David opts for the three days of plague, and he says partly because, who knows, God might be merciful, I'd rather be in God's hands than in the hands of these other kingdoms around me. And uh, as you said at the bottom there, Vic, uh, God does relent from this at the end. Actually, I think it's on the next page. Or no, right at the bottom of this page, into the next page here. Yeah, uh, the Lord saw it and relented concerning the disaster. So David's right. <laughs> David knows that God actually uh, is going to, this three days of plague is actually going to be less than three days of plague because uh, David is hopeful that God will... Uh, relent from punishing because God knows that the Lord is the Lord, gracious and merciful, um, uh, abounding in steadfast love, ready to relent from punishing. Right, uh, and here, he here that is happening. Forgiveness on 398. And he asked for forgiveness on three ninety eight, and he gets forgiveness. Yeah. So here's a surprising thing. So a couple things here. Satan is is credited with inciting David to do this. Mm -hmm. Satan is not mentioned in the in the Second Samuel telling of this. So Satan is is. Put in Chronicles. So Chronicles, looking back, says, well, why would David have done this? It must have been Satan incited him or something like that. But it, it doesn't say anything about that in the Second Samuel one. Yeah. Satan tempted him and David took the action. So, it, yes, it's good. This, so this isn't excusing David or it shouldn't be excusing David. David's still the one who does it. Yeah. Uh -huh. Another surprise is why did the Lord go to the dad to see it and not talk directly to David? about what was going to happen, the three, the three things that were going to happen. Oh, I see. So the yeah. question is, why does God speak to David through Gad, a seer, a prophet, we could say, but it's a little different word there, um, rather than going to David directly? Yeah. It's a good question, although I would say God typically acts that way. So who tell, how does David learn of his sin with Bathsheba? Yeah. Nathan the prophet, right? How does David learn that he's not supposed to build the temple? Nathan the prophet has a vision and comes and talks to him. Uh, God speaks through, well, in modern times, we would call them preachers, right? People who speak on behalf of God or prophets is, an, is a, another way that's talked about. Uh, people who speak for God to others. So another way of saying this is that God uses creatures to speak to other creatures. God very rarely, there's only a couple instances where it's God directly speaking. Even in Job, God is speaking out of a creature, the whirlwind, right? God is speaking out of a thunderstorm. Yeah. The interesting thing is David, son of Jesse, was king over all Israel. He ruled over Israel 40 years, seven in Hebrew and 33 in Jerusalem. Mm. And Jesus was 33 years old. There's a lot of really interesting. What page is that on? Um, 412. Yeah, okay. So page 412, uh, kind of telling uh, the end of David's reign. So David, son of Jesse, king over all Israel, he ruled over Israel 40 years, seven in Hebron, 33 in Jerusalem. So 33 is a traditional age for Jesus's uh, ministry that comes from Luke saying Jesus was around 30 when he starts his ministry. And then in John's gospel, uh, mm -hmm. there are three Passovers mentioned. So that's where we get the three years for Jesus's ministry length. Um, and uh, so that would put him at 33 at his crucifixion. 
So, uh, so there's a there's an interesting parallel. The seven in Hebron, so that's an important number. Forty is an important number. Uh, there's a lot of really important numbers in here, uh, and it makes you wonder a little bit if these being rounded out a little bit. You know, it's Chronicles sort of symbolically telling it this way. Yeah. Twelve. I noticed the number twelve. The number yeah comes up. Uh, the number twelve shows up a bunch of times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think I've mentioned this before too, but twelve. To, they go out, you know. The they go out of their way to have twelve tribes when they sort of have thirteen. And even in the genealogies, they have the half tribe of Manasseh. Did you notice that? And the half tribe of uh, Ephraim, you know, they, uh, uh, Joseph's Joseph's two sons, because um, there's sort of thirteen tribes. If you because they each have their own land allotment, so there's twelve land allotments. But Levi doesn't get a land allotment. Their land, their allotment is their temple service essentially. Uh, and uh, so there's sort of 13 tribes, but they go out of their way to make it 12. 12 land allotments, 12 tribes, because they descend from, from Joseph. So the number 12 is important for some reason. Uh, and you see it here again uh, in the dividing. This is on page 404 and 405. Uh, the dividing of the temple. Sir, I think this is a temple service. Is this right? I remember? Or music service. Yeah, there, there's, there's 12 again and again. So the first lot, which is for Asaph, fell to Joseph, his sons and relatives, 12. The second to Gedaliah, him and his relatives and sons, 12. Um, yeah, which is interesting. Yeah. I noticed it was really whitewashed. Um, you know, ah. like um, 412 and okay. David, um, you know, he lived at a good old age, and, um, or maybe I think it was, but, you know, he, he lived a good yeah. old age, age and, you know, and, and surrounded by his son, you know, and his son Solomon took over. Well, we know that yeah. there was a lot of... So if we go back to First Kings, for example, there's two chapters. Well, we, you already mentioned... One of David's sons, uh, uh, um, whose name we don't remember. No, it's not Ab. Yes, well, so so there's a lot of David's family drama that's not included. So Absalom, there's Absalom and uh, and the other son who Absalom kills. But even after that, when Solomon, when David's on his deathbed, there's another son of David, and I can't remember who it is, who claims the the kingship and starts to have himself appointed king. And uh, and there's this kind of behind the scenes work going on with Nathan and Bathsheba. I don't think Bathsheba's ever mentioned in Chronicles, which is interesting. Uriah is, her husband, Uriah the Hittite shows up in one of the lists. Bathsheba's never mentioned. Uh, the mother of Solomon, you feel like that would be important, but you know. Uh, and, uh, you know, but they come in and say, didn't you say Solomon was going to be king? And David says, yes, of course. And and then there's a there's a few chapters of violence and killing that come as Solomon establishing himself king. Whereas here on page 412, Here's, the, here's basically the whole story of Solomon's king, uh, kingship. Solomon, son of David, established himself firmly over his kingdom. That's it. <laughs> so it makes it sound very like it's just this nice hand. But we know it from uh, First Kings in particular in the end of Second Samuel that this was a much more tumultuous thing. Also, the only I think the only sin David commits or is said to commit in Chronicles is that one of the census, right? So he repents from the census. And, uh, but we know, of course, of a very other famous sin that David commits, that Psalm 51 comes out of, but it doesn't tell that story of Bathsheba uh, and Uriah the Hittite. But on 396, uh -huh. it does say that in times of kings go off the war. Yes, I know. And David remained, and that's, isn't that when? Yep. Uh, yeah. So here's here's the Bathsheba story. In the, in the spring, the time when kings go off to war, Joab led out the armed forces. He laid waste to the land, da, 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 da. But David remained in Jerusalem. Joab attacked Rabbah and left it in ruins. I don't know if that's exactly where Uriah is killed, but that might be. I bet that's exactly the city. Uh, and then David took the crown. That's all it is. And then it's David was successful in this victory. But we know that there's something else that happens there. Now, I don't know that Chronicles is hiding this. I'm not sure that's exactly what Chronicles is, is doing. Because the inclusion, I'll come to you in a second, Mark. The inclusion of something like that line, in the spring, at the time when King goes off to war, but David remained in Jerusalem. If you know the history of Israel at all, you know, I mean, we, from just reading it, we hear that and we're like, oh, we know the story this is going to be. And it's sort of surprising that it doesn't include it. And so I'm not sure that it's trying to hide it because it's sort of alluding to it, but it's not saying it directly. And maybe we can talk about why that is. Mark, what were you going to say? I can't remember. Is Chronicles written much later than this? So, yeah, I, I, we don't know dates specifically, but Chronicles certainly is written. Chronicles is written for and from the perspective of the exiles who have returned to Jerusalem. We have a, I think just in the nature, we have a tendency to... Um, 
later we get away from a, mm. an issue with more cost, cost overlays. Oh. The, uh, if you think about just yeah. our present. Yeah, right. Uh, but our fa- our founding myths, right? The founding yeah. stories that we have of this country. Yeah. 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 So is there just sort of this natural human tendency of glossing over the negative and elevating the positive here, of portraying things as being much more clear than they are in the moment? And I think of that with you know the American Revolution and like the well and the the the, the making of the Constitution, for example. From our perspective, looking back, and the way that it's often talked about, it's like very everybody sort of came to an agreement and knew this is what this should be, this is what this should be. But if you read the like the primary source documents, there's all sorts of debate and lots of disagreement about the right way forward all the time. And it's much you know just the world always is messier than these sort of narratives allow. So something about Chronicle seems to clean up some of the messiness of what we see in First Sec, uh, Second Samuel and First Kings. So I think that's that could be a part of it, absolutely. That's yeah. why they always say that you shouldn't see uh, law made or sausage. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You don't want to see how law is made. And you don't want to see how the sausage is made. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's not as pretty a process as you think it should be, Carmen. Yeah. Uh, my supervisor, Alan, two things. I think we've covered the census, but I don't really still understand why that was done. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, let's talk about that a little bit also, more. Also, it was they had leaders appointed over the music, and we uh-huh. look at. Ah. Joy, but it's commanded in there that Interesting. They had, yeah. And then Good. And they were, there was one part about somebody played the harp and was Excuse me. praying your name messages from God. I don't remember the exact words. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I thought that was interesting. Yeah. So noticing, I'll, say your, I'll just repeat your second one first. Noticing uh, the centrality of music. Like there's a lot of space dedicated to, you know, the families that are in charge of the music that is to be played at the temple for worship. Like that there's, you know, it's not just an extra, it's not a sideshow. This is, this is, there's something central to this. Uh, and it even facilitates, we see this in the Saul story, not in Chronicles, because Saul is barely mentioned in Chronicles, um, just enough to know that he was king and died. And you get illusions that he was mean to David a few times. Uh, but, but if you remember, uh, Saul is having these episodes, this, this unclean spirit, this evil spirit from God, right, that's tormenting him. And the only thing that calms those, that relieves those, is David playing the harp. Um, and so that there is this, uh, there's this, I don't know, spiritual something to, to music. The music has this power uh, to, to relieve some of this, and that's recognized. Uh, so the first thing you mentioned uh, was uh, about the, um, was that something about music that you wanted yeah. to say? Yeah, say that before I, I go to the other thing. Yeah. 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 So we noticing that, yeah, music was not, you know, you didn't just have music books you could go buy and learn these melodies. You had to be taught them. Yeah, that's right. Um, I don't know if there was any musical notation. If there was, it hasn't survived. So we don't have it, uh, or at least we don't have access to it. So this is why, you know, some a lot of those things that are in the Psalms of, you know, according to, and it'll say, you know, a dove or whatever and and we assume we think that those are melodies possibly but we have no idea what they sounded like and there's there's no record of that um and yeah maybe we can make some approximations based on like sort of modern modern traditional music in those regions but how has that changed over millennia you know it's hard to know um so so that could be part of it too is it's important that you keep it within the tradition because there isn't an easy way of sharing it beyond I, the teacher, teach you, the student. Uh, the first thing you asked about or was mentioning was the census, which, why is God mad about the census? Uh, does anybody have any thoughts on that? Yeah, do you have any thoughts on that? My thought is that they needed to have enough faith that God uh, could conquer anybody. Uh, or, I mean, 300 people at one time, you know. Yeah. Uh, and just have faith that God could do it. Why, why yeah. are you... On your own strength. Yeah. So something about this, this shows a lack of faith in God to provide and to make them able to, because censuses are for two purposes. They're for, they're for well, they're for one purpose. They're for what the, the government can get out of you, right? That's in the ancient world. Those are the only, only purpose for the census. Yeah. And so usually that's military service, which, uh, but it also taxes, right? So those two things. 
Um, but military service is almost a form of tax. You could think of it that way. Um, and, you know, we have governments that hopefully provide a bit more for us now, right? So census is also in deal, deal with distributions of resources and so on. We could have debates about levels of taxation and those sorts of things. But that's what the census is for. Um, and you notice it, it's sort of retold later. That story is told a second time from Joab's perspective a little more, where Joab doesn't count Benjamin and he doesn't count Levi. He, there's, a, there's a few people he doesn't count because he's so offended by David's order to carry out the census. And Joab is the military commander. So this census seems to be especially a military one. And they come out with it. There's like one million some people who can wield the sword, which, by the way, is not that different from modern day Israel, I would say. Interesting. There's like seven million people in, modern, in Israel today. And if you go by men of sword wielding age, you're probably down in that one to two million realm. I don't know where that is. So I was just that's an interesting thing to know. But that's what surprised me when they were doling all these things out with the numbers. Yeah. They were so big. So many numbers. So many people. Yeah. So many people that were yeah. assigned mm -hmm. this to this. And how many people actually returned from the exile? Well, we're not there yet, but when we get to there, I'm going to preach about this a little bit today. It's a total of like 50,000. So this story is being written for and among perhaps, you can think of this as this is a retelling of the history to this 50,000 people who have returned from Babylon after the exile. And they're coming to a city that's destroyed. There's no walls. The walls have been torn down. Jerusalem was essentially burned. Um, you know, there's no temple. The temple's been destroyed. Uh, there's no distinct Israel or Jewish population anymore. It's other peoples have moved in and settled. You know, maybe the Babylonians invited some people in or other things have happened. And so this is a people that have been completely torn away from their traditions, from their land, from their uh, worship, uh, from their God, perhaps they might think that, although the prophets are again and again saying God is not restricted just to this land, although um, you can see why people would think that. Um, and now Chronicles is retelling their history. And I think that's maybe a key into why Chronicles tells the story the way it does. So why does it spend so much time on genealogies? Well, this is who we are, right? This is, this is in the same way that, you know, I don't know if it's quite as true for us today, but if you go back to the Norwegians who were here uh, a century ago, you know, the ones who had only been in this country for a few decades, how important was it their ancestry and how they connected to, there, there are people out of place, they're making a new life in a new place, and, um, and they're holding on to those traditions. And I think there's something similar here. Or another example could be, and we're going to see this uh, when we get into Ezra, is one of the big issues in the book of Ezra after the temple is built is intermarriage. That so many of the Israelites have married other nations. And we say, okay, well, that seems a little weird that you'd be against you know, it calls back like laws against interracial marriage in this country. So it, it feels weird, right? But they want to keep their tradition. Like they're trying to reestablish themselves as a people. And uh, maybe a way we could think of that is, so in this country, there was a long history of uh, removing children from their households if they were Native American, right? So indigenous children being removed from their households and being placed with white families and sort of trying to white, whiten them in a way. Uh, so the, no, in the last century. That's why I said a long history. Yeah, no, it's, uh, yeah. Um, depending on who you ask, it's still sort of happening. Um, or there's at least laws working on changing some of the adoption laws and so on. And, you know, laws aren't perfect. Sometimes they don't work out the way they're supposed to. But some of the impetus behind this is, this is a people who have feel see their culture slipping away because the family ties are being broken up. And it's not exactly intermarriage, but it's something close to that. And so I think that's the way to understand once we get there, which we will, I think we get there this week. We might hear, or maybe it's next week. I can't remember. Um, of the of the, the the very strict prohibitions of intermarriage and the actual forcible dissolution. Well, I don't know if it's forcible, but it's this dissolution of marriages is actually what ends up happening. Um, I don't remember if people are forced to do it or if it's sort of a strongly encouraged. But and what's the difference? Maybe, but. Uh, Understanding it through that lens, um, that it's not sort of, well, it's dirty to be interracially married or something like that. But it's this is a people who is small, just, just a remnant, 
and they're trying to um, hold themselves together. And we can critique to what extent they do this in a good way or a bad way. Uh, we can see ways in which their attempt to hold themselves together gets in the way of God's greater purpose for them, uh, even by the time of Jesus. This is something that's going on in Jesus's uh, debates with his Pharisees that they're or with his the Pharisees of his time that um, this is getting in the way of God's work actually in some ways but we can understand why the small people who have been cut off from their ancestors cut off from all this might want a story that's fairly simply told that's centered around the temple because um, all of this is sort of a temple history uh, even David's sin of the threshing or of the uh, of the census. What does that end with? Well, it ends with the angel of God the, that's giving the plague stopping on this particular spot, this threshing floor, which David then goes and purchase, and it becomes the site of the future temple. I mean, so even like, why is that story included in Chronicles? It might be just because of that detail, because it explains why the temple site is chosen. I don't know. Um, but there's something going on in Chronicles here. And so what do we do with this? Do we... Uh, to what extent is this useful to help us understand how God is sort of, or how the people are being sort of reconstituted after this disaster? And also, how limited is a history like this? To what extent is a history like this that's sort of whitewashed, or at least simplified for the sake of inspiring people, need to give way to a more full history like we have in First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings? I don't know. That's something to think about. So though. that's like our history. It is like our history. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You want to say a little bit more about that? or? Yeah. I, I mean, just so many things now that um, mm. are being dealt with. Who yeah. Idea? Yeah, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Civil War period. Yeah. 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 So often the way that the, the stories of our history, the uh, American history, have been told in overly simplified ways that tend to lionize certain people, right? Um, whereas the reality is more complex and, and there's, you know, there's huge fights in the country right now around education in different parts of the country in particular, where, you know, should we just stick to this simplified version or is it okay to actually deal with these other things? So, you know, the, uh, was it the 16 or 15, 1619? Is that the name of that project that was telling the story of slavery in this country? The 1619 project. And then the 1776 project, that's the, uh, the answer to that, to, to undo that. And these are debates that are had. So we can see some of this in scripture that Chronicles and, uh, and 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Samuel have some different perspectives uh, on the telling of the history. And they maybe both have their place. Um, but they are in tension with each other. And the, the prophets are in tension with each other. So some of the prophets of this period are a bit in tension, that there is real debate about what does the restoration of Israel in this time look like? What ought it to look like? And, and where is that to go? So there, I think there's lessons to be found in the wrestling here um, for us today. Uh, it's interesting that both of these are included. You, know, you can imagine a much more... Uh, simpler Old Testament that did not include one or the other, you know, that eject. wouldn't it be nicer if we just had the, the simpler story and we didn't have to wrestle with things, these things? That's not what we have. We don't have one unified gospel story of Jesus' life and ministry. We have four gospel accounts that line up remarkably well with each other but have tensions and have differences in how they tell the story and have some uh, uh, you know, Matthew Matthew has Jesus coming into uh, Jerusalem with both a colt and a full of a colt, right? They're both there. Or a donkey and a full of a donkey, that's what I mean. And uh, the other Gospels don't say that. And so like, okay, there's a weird tension there. Is Matthew mistaken? Is Matthew trying to make a different point with doubling things, which Matthew does in a couple other stories? I don't know. But we, you know, for some reason, when the Holy Spirit has uh, carried this through to us, the Spirit has done it in such a way that it's much messier than this maybe simpler story simple story we'd like to have so yeah like it or not here we are yeah i think there's more growth opportunity hmm. in the messiness though like by having the different perspectives or two stories you get a fuller picture potentially it sure confuse but i think there, there is more potential for growth and learning for the gener in the people who are dealing with it as well as the generations to come yeah so there's, I'll just repeat what you said for the recording, that there's uh, 
um, more opportunity for growth and learning in the, the tensions for, for generations to follow after than if it had been, you know, unified, simplified, harmonized, um, whatever you want to say before that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I think it's puzzling that God chose such a small area of the world. That's puzzling. Yes, it is. The chosen yeah. people. Or that God would choose a people at all, actually. Or even that God would choose any people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that that, you know, I've got a map of the whole world and that's a teeny It's little small. Place. It's like Western Washington. That's the size of Israel. Yeah. It's, it's a small area. Yeah, I think that's puzzling. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's puzzling that God would do it this way. It's puzzling that the fulfillment of this promise, you know, I will uh, establish the throne of his kingdom forever, falls on a man uh, born in backwater Galilee, not even, you know, by Jerusalem, uh, in the first century, at a time when uh, Israel is just, I mean, they're part of the Roman Empire, they're a small well, there are a few different provinces of the Roman Empire. They're not even a unified province. And uh, to a man who goes around, has no political power of his own, uh, performs miracles, and then is crucified. Dies the most ignominious death you can, uh, you can think of. And then uh, those who uh, experience his resurrection, who see him resurrected or come to believe in him resurrected, that Paul I'm thinking specifically, can say things like, yes, our Messiah became sin for us. I mean, what? None of that makes any sense. That's not how, like, why would God overcome sin by becoming sin? It's just, it just doesn't make any sense. And yet that's what we have, that we have a God who has taken on, here's the Lamb of God, as uh, we read in John's Gospel, who uh, takes away the sin of the world, who carries them. So takes away doesn't mean make them disappear. It means, like, puts them on his back and walks off. Like, that's, that's what he's doing. He's taking them on to himself. He's taking them to the cross. Uh, and that's what our faith is. God is always acting in ways that don't make a lot of sense uh, huh. to us, not the ways we, we would want to. to believe. Yeah, well, it forces us to believe. It, it takes any other option out of our hands. So how do you make ourselves right with God? Do we, maybe as the, restore, the restoration exiles are trying to do, do we uh, arrange our society in such a way that it perfectly imitates the glorious, glorious nature of our history, perfectly does what God wants? No, that's actually not going to work. Uh, where the only thing we have is faith. The only thing we are left with is to trust in the God who does this um, through Jesus, right? Um, we're, we're taken out of that. Well, that doesn't mean that those other things don't matter. It's not like, uh, you know, the reason I'm, I'm having you identify the law here is because the law is important. It, like, it's not that the law uh, is bad or something like that, but the law won't save us. The law can't yeah. save us. Um, yeah. Only yeah. Jesus will save us, yeah. Um, so yeah, this is, this is, this is good. This is, uh, good to be confronted with these things. And these are the sorts of things that sometimes people, if you've ever had conversations with people who are, um, uh, very against, uh, belief, faith, Christianity, um, whether they're atheist or just think that the Bible is ridiculous and is a relic of the past that should be left behind, one of the things that will get pointed to sometimes are like the discrepancies between Chronicles and for Second Samuel, First Second Kings, or the discrepancies between Gospels. And sometimes those discrepancies aren't as real as they think they are. But even when they are, what what they tend not to understand is they're they're not actually making an argument against faith. They're making an argument against a very simplistic and legalistic reading of of the Bible. If, if the law alone is what it is. If getting it right is the thing that saves us, then that would be a good attack they're making. That's not what it is. You know, the Bible's actually making us all not right. As Paul puts it, uh, all were condemned, or uh, God has imprisoned all under disobedience so that God may have mercy on, on all. Like, we're not actually finding our legal justification here uh, or in our own lives. Uh, we're actually going to be, uh, I don't know, disabused of that notion. And then, so that God can actually act in the gospel through a promise. No. Uh, what time are we at? What other surprises? Any other surprises or thoughts, questions? Yeah, uh, the one I have is on page 411. Yeah, um, 411. David is praising the Lord. Mm. And as I read that, I, I, I just had feelings like, oh, David, you think that the Lord is your very best friend. Mm. And you know him <laughs> so well. Mm. And you can just describe all this stuff. And it just felt like, oh, 
It felt a little like a little, and when you say that, are you hearing that in sort of a negative way? Like he's a little bit, or, no, no, I or in a positive way? It's, it's a wonderful way. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. So uh, noticing on 411, when David's praising the Lord, you know, David, David clearly just yeah. loves God, right? Yeah. And we hear stories even in here where David is afraid of the Lord for a while after Uzzah dies mm -hmm. in the carrying of the ark, for example. Um and yet David keeps coming back to this sort of proclamation of faith that, uh, yeah, God, God is David's best friend, even if, you know, David's on the wrong side of God uh, often. Uh, it always goes back to pray. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Yeah. Remind me of something. Yesterday, I thought to myself, God is, I had to ponder the micromanaging of certain things. Hmm. I don't feel like God micromanages us, but I also, he was giving direct instructions on you should do this or you should yeah. do that, and I just haven't reconciled that yet. Maybe yeah, so uh, so the question that's sort of being raised in your head by this is, is God a micromanager, it, right? Is God micromanaging? Yeah, I don't think he is, but then yeah. I was listening, I listened to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it was, I was thinking, he's mad when you're not doing these things. There seem to be some things in which God is very particular, right? Yeah, there do seem to be some certain things. Well, and then yeah. I thought about the temple and how every, I mean, yeah. there's lots of things where he gave really clear instructions and directions. Yeah. So is he that clear with us about what we're supposed to do? Or what are the things in which there is sort of a micromanaging? What are the things in which there is not, in yeah. which there's more freedom? Yeah. Those are good questions to ask. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I come back to often um, is, you know, people, I'm trying to think of an, okay, here's an example, uh, swearing, using, using bad <laughs> words, okay, uh, now, careful, I won't say any bad words myself, I don't know see but, uh, um, but often, you know, so often I, I, I remember often just sort of thinking, and I don't know if I've specifically taught this or not, maybe you have had this or not, but that the, you know, you shall not take the Lord's name in vain includes just saying bad words. Like, so anything, you're just not supposed to swear because that's one of the commandments. Well, recognizing that's not what taking the Lord's name in vain means. That's not what making wrongful use of the Lord's name is. Uh, it's It can in involve using God's name as a swear word, right? Uh, but it doesn't say anything about all those other, uh, you know, farm-related words we've got uh, that we use sometimes. And, uh, but, uh, so, so sometimes people will say, well, you know, is it, you know, we'll apologize, especially I'm a pastor, so I'm in conversations with people where sometimes they'll, something will slip out and they'll apologize because there's a pastor in the room. And I'm like, well, is there a commandment against that word? Like, do I, I don't know a commandment against that word. And so I sort of think of this idea of what is God particularly interested in and not by, well, what has God given us commands about? And given us commands about. And sometimes those aren't the same things. You know, God has not given us, you know, the Norwegian, whatever all else we are here, uh, residents of Skagit Valley, specific instructions on the building of a temple, right? Uh, we have a lot of freedom in the architecture of our sanctuary. What serves the gospel, what doesn't? And that's going to differ in different places, in different um, uh, communities across different times. Uh, you know, that's, you know, what, what made a lot of sense a hundred years ago might not make sense today, or it might. You know, some things are very stable, some things are less stable. Um, you know, the colors of the pews or the carpets, right? This is a thing that sometimes congregations will get up in arms about. Um, I wasn't here during this remodeling, but I imagine there were some passionate debates at times uh, between certain people. But there are other things that God has given specifics about, right? So we have the Ten Commandments uh, that we teach. And, and even those, there's, there's a lot of room for freedom in there of uh, interpreting or trying to make sense of. So uh, where has God given us specifics and where hasn't, I think, is is a way of getting at that. Vic, you had your hand up. Uh, an example of that was yesterday. At the oh. The yeah. funeral and all the, the Benson family. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, many of them are way out of the area. And, mm -hmm. and there was a, a lot of comments how wonderful the facilities are still here and they expanded and and taken care of yeah and, and mm. uh, I picked that up from yeah numerous relatives yeah yeah and, and a lot of those people have not been in here yeah. in the sanctuary for decades yeah, yeah. long time um, Oscar Lagerlin shared uh, I got married in this sanctuary you know and uh, 
and and there was a picture actually of Janet and uh, and Gary's uh, wedding picture on the table here, and it's yeah that altar looks exactly the same. Mm-hmm. Now all the stuff around it's different, right? Every you know the the walls different, the floor is different. You couldn't really see it in the picture, but I just know uh, the the width of the room is different than it was back then. You know, there's been a lot of changes, and yet there have been some things that have been maintained, and we have freedom in that. Uh, right and and yeah. you try and do that to better or better extents and you don't always get it perfect but there's a lot of freedom in in how that works um, yeah, I think of uh, you know as as Christians I think you know the thing that we have at the center is the gospel this promise right and everything around that I think of the sort of containers of, of giving this gospel and those containers are going to work in different places and not like if we took this exact sanctuary and we moved it to Tanzania uh, with that exact altar, with that, you know, all of those things, it would not be as effective there, right? Uh, as, you know, they're often worshiping basically outdoors or maybe in a covered area. Uh, partly it would get stifling hot in that room really quickly. I guess if we could move the air conditioning, that would be helpful. But, uh, you know, like there's just different reasons for doing things in different ways. Um, and so the question I'm always asking is how well is this container presenting the gospel? Is it getting in the way of the gospel? Sometimes the containers get in the way of the gospel. We get so focused on the container. Um, or is there something that could make it the gospel more available? Or sometimes we make the mistake too of thinking, well, we'll just get rid of all the containers completely. But we actually need those containers in order to hold the gospel. Like we actually need them to be presented to us physically in a place, in a time by specific people in bread and wine. You know, the, the what of the bread and wine doesn't matter in one sense. The wafers can, uh, that, that sacrament is valid with wafers or with the baked bread that Jane makes. But there's something about the bread that Jane makes that feels like a more appropriate container for the gospel than those, you know, mass-produced wafers, right? Uh, and so it's not a question of like what is the thing, but it's a question of how best do we present this. And so, you know, there's always room for improvement on that, right? There's always uh, adapting because the world changes. But uh, I don't remember how we got on this topic, but uh, yeah, God being a micromanager, I guess. So there are some things where that really matters, and there are other things where there's a lot of freedom. And I'd say most of our lives, there's a lot of freedom, right? No. Any other questions or surprises? Got just a few more minutes. Talked about bad words <laughs> yesterday. My daughter and I went to Rosengard, yeah. and I was looking for books for the kids. And I picked up one about bees, and it said, O-M-F-G. <laughs> I, I didn't notice that. And then when I got home and started to read it, I thought, well, what is this? <laughs> now, I would say that the G in that one is actually, uh, we, are, we are infringing on that second commandment at that point. But yeah, yeah. we are taking uh, God as an exclamation point. Yeah, but uh, I'm not giving that to. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Uh, So going forward this week, we uh, read. I think we get into like halfway through Ezra, if I remember right. See four eighty. Let me just double check how far into Ezra we get. Or do we read all of Ezra? Yeah. It is. It's all of Ezra. Excellent. Thank you. Um, So. Uh, so Second Chronicles is going to be mostly about Solomon, and then it's going to have the other kings, but it's going to be, again, kind of reading it in the same lens that we've had it. Of It's a retelling of the story, but it's a, it's a simpler story for a people that are just barely holding together in a way. Um, and so notice, you'll notice differences, and you'll notice that there's just a lot less detail in a lot of ways. So, um, I mean, at the point where First Chronicles ends, is at the beginning of First Kings. So First and Second Kings are covering exactly the same period of history as just Second Chronicles, which isn't that long of a book, really. Um, and then Ezra. And so Ezra, uh, and I'm going to be preaching on Ezra today, so we'll hear a little bit more about Ezra, but um, Ezra is really around the, the rebuilding of the temple. But again, it's centered around this reestablishment of the people. Uh, and then Nehemiah is really about the reestablishment of Jerusalem, so it's the building of the walls specifically. Um, but uh, they're named for the people who are sort of, um, who come in from outside uh, with some authority that they get from the Persian Empire who has taken over the Babylonians and allowed the people to return and are um, sort of overseeing, supervising this work and and working to overcome the hurdles that are being placed in the reestablishment of it. Um, And so, and Nehemiah in particular is uh, interesting because it's a first-person memoir mostly. 
I did this, I did this. May God remember me well for this, which uh, is something in Nehemiah. But uh, I shall, I'll talk more about Nehemiah actually when we um, get to that week, because that's not this coming week. But um, So Second Chronicles and Ezra this week. All right, let me uh, close this in prayer and uh, send us on our way. Good and gracious God, I thank you for your word to us again. Uh, I thank you for the ways in which you instruct us and the ways in which you empower us to, to live out uh, your word here in this world um, as we are able to, uh, to the best of our abilities that you have given us. Um, I ask that you would continue to guide us, uh, that you would continue to instruct us, that you would continue to fill us uh, with the gift of your word and your promise. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, John. You are welcome.